Hi, fans of High Quality Entertainment. We are here to talk about the Shags philosophy of the world. <laughs> That's a great record. That's why I'm here. No, we're here to talk about the, it'll be the 35th anniversary, right? 45th. 45th. Is it 45th? Okay, 45th. That's right. I know this because yes, I, I have a certain yeah. birthday coming up that coincides with when that record came out or slightly after. Yep. Oh, boo to you. And this is Sparks, number one in heaven that was released in 1979. And this is the, the new deluxe version of it. Here's Ron and Russell. And this was not recorded in Germany. They lied to us. Is it L.A.? It was L.A. Mm -hmm. A lie. That's interesting. Hmm. And so um, maybe, maybe, Monte, you could introduce everybody because. Well, I will introduce myself and then I'll let everybody else introduce themselves. How about that? That's a good idea. Okay. So I am Monte Mallon. Um, I'm a big Sparks That's fan. enough. That's enough. I'm a big Sparks You're fan. You're famous. We know who you are now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course. That's, that's enough introduction for me. Big Sparks fan. You Tell us about your YouTube channel. I do. Okay. Well, since you asked, then yes, I have a YouTube show. Uh, two people who are with us today have been guests. That is uh, that is uh, Christian and Chelsea, and the other two people will be guests. And the show is called Sparks Entertainment and Art. And we explore all we here's my new motto. If there's anything about Sparks that we can overanalyze, by golly, we're going to do it. <laughs> And that's what the show is about. Now we're having a great time, folks, and join us for the fun. Excellent. It is a lot of fun to a lot of fun to watch. It is. I, fun I to mentioned watch. that on my plug. I mentioned that on my podcast recently. It's just there's so much there's so much joy going around between you and your uh, in interviewee. It's infectious. Well, thank it's you. Great. It, it, it's so much fun. It's all about the people that I talk to and all the great things that they do. Uh, I'm sure Chelsea will talk a little bit about what she's done, which is absolutely amazing. And uh, if I were being interviewed, I'd tell you all about the show and why I'm doing it. But suffice it to say, I hope everybody will join me because I appreciate your comments, Christian. And it is a lot of fun. It's a labor of love, but it is worth every minute. All right, I'm a little Christian. behind. All right, I'll go. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Christian. Christian Huey, thanks for having me back on. Uh, Larry Stud Muffin. Um, I've, uh, my, my Sparks fandom, I, I haven't had the pleasure of being a fan for quite as long as these guys. I'm, I'm doing my darndest to catch up, but uh, it's been, uh, you know, uh, close to two decades now. Uh, and uh, I have off and on, uh, been hosting, writing, you know, whatevering a, uh, an all sparks podcast called all you ever think about is sparks. And I, I frequently, uh, get a lot of, uh, uh, insight and assistance from my podcast wingman over here, uh, Monty. And, uh, yeah, we are, we're going in chronological order. That's the idea anyway, through the entire discography. Um, we're, now in the middle of the 1983 album Sparks in Outer Space. Reminder to myself to connect with you, Monty, so we can finish that up. And um, yeah, I'm excited uh, to be here again and to talk about these two magnificent albums. Absolutely. And uh, Chelsea. Hi, uh, I'm Chelsea, and when I am not rage quitting technology, um, I <laughs> am um, working on a song for song covers album of Number One in Heaven, um, recorded in the style of early 1940 or 1930s, 1940s crooners like Cliff Edwards and George Formby. Um, we actually just wrapped the vocals today. Um, and, uh, which might be why I'm a little than usual. Um, but uh, I have been working on this for almost a year. Um, and I'm happy to say that I have um, licensed the, uh, the songs. So uh, I can say this is officially licensed. Um, and I also um, 
uh, I also received a grant from my local cultural council and um, I'm very excited to uh, to be releasing it hopefully this fall. So um, okay. it's a pleasure to be here. Cool. Very good. Very exciting. Thank you. And Joe. Well, I'm the slacker here, I think, but um, I don't have a blog or a, a podcast or a YouTube channel. I just <laughs> crash everybody's stuff. Yeah. That's what I do. Yeah. And that's and that's fine. Um, I have a ukulele. I've never learned to play it. <laughs> Maybe I'll learn to play that. Um, I've been a Sparks fan for a long time. Unlike Christian, I was alive and, and more than probably an adult, I, I guess, when the album came out. So I do remember it. Um, and I've been on, you know, the Christian's podcast and Larry's before, um, uh, not Monty's yet, but, you know, I like to hear everybody go on and on about things. Cause I'm, I, I guess I come at it differently. Yeah. I sing and I dance. I, I'm a dancer and a drummer. Cool. <laughs> yeah. And the other album we're going to kind of talk about a little bit is no Noel's dancing is dangerous. That was the album title, right? Mm -hmm. And I did buy that back. I don't have it now, but I yeah, want to get the, the new remaster of it. And I did buy it though back in 19, was it 1979 when it came out? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it was produced by Ron and Russell Mayo and the songs were written by them. And it's kind of similar in quite, you know, the music and everything to number one in heaven. And uh, so maybe let's, let's start with uh, Noel and anybody's thoughts on that album hmm. i am so ready to jump in yeah. but i will let other people go <sighs> all right since i came on here hoping to talk about this album in, in particular uh it's um, first of all the, the 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 feeling that i i get when i approach this album is something like Mid 1978, um, Ron and Russ are hanging out with Giorgio Moroder, and it's like hanging out with your dad, and he shows you his new Corvette. And the Corvette is Giorgio's studio, and actually it lets you get to drive the Corvette a few times, and that's the album that came from that. And then your dad trusts you so much, he lets you take the Corvette on a road trip, on a joy ride. Now, that's not to say that Giorgio actually lent them his studio, but he may have lent them some equipment like that, that uh, the Moog synthesizer that is all over number one in heaven because a lot of the synthesized sounds sound um, very sim similar. But you can tell that Ron and Russell are taking all the lessons that they learned while making that album and kind of like it's like they've got a take-home test and uh they're just uh you know trying to figure things out for 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 themselves um like it's like a it's sketchbook uh, in some ways uh but it's very but it's but it it it, it it's very cohesive mm -hmm. and i'll say more about it later but i'll let someone else jump in joel yeah i um I know I had it when it came out. Uh, of course, I was a member of the fan club, so they gave us lo loads and loads of information about that and number one in heaven. So I was prepared, you know, and I, you, know, you look at pictures of, of Noel and it's like um, the spandex era, you know. So I, I listened to it, but not as much as I have listened to it in the last few weeks, you know, because um, I, I was at the time I was really into punk rock. I was in a band. So I was kind of not in my, you know, hemisphere to really study uh, but I've been listening to the album and it's funny that um, uh, is there more than is there more to life than dancing yep. and I think about that line in La Dolce Vita life isn't much but there's nothing else to do I went oh yeah those connect together and and I got that song stuck in my head I'm, I'm sorry to say and I was dancing to all the songs yeah. trying to get exercise but um, but I know I had it I don't have it anymore yeah. So I'm looking forward to buying it when it comes out. Yeah, I, I haven't heard the, the full album in over 40 years, but I just remember when I bought it, I loved it. It was, you know, like the sister to number one in heaven. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm looking forward to buying it again. Yeah. Uh, Chelsea, do you, 
Are you familiar with that? Or? I am. Yeah. yeah. So I, uh, I listened to it, Monty, when you sent me the text inviting me to be on this. Um, and it was an album that I was aware existed, but I just, I never sought it out. Um, I don't know why. And it's the kind of, the feeling that I have about it, um, it's a very good album, but it, it feels like the kind of thing where I have such a, like, I have such an emotional connection with Number One in Heaven that um, this feels like something that someone would say, hey, you like Number One in Heaven, you would also enjoy this. <laughs> and it's good, but I just, you know, it it, it hits all the, the, um, the things that I would, you know, that I, I would uh, want out of a synth pop album, but I don't have the same connection to it that I think I would have had if it, if I heard it when it came out or if I'd heard it after the first time I heard number one in heaven. So um, I'm excited to just sit back and listen to uh, what everyone else has to say about this album. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's a great point about the connection because yeah. <clears throat> obviously it's hard to have the same connection to this album okay. that I did. I, I think you've hit it exactly right. But as I said earlier, um, when we were getting ready for I'm on this podcast, I've listened to this more in the last um, month than I did the entire 40 years before <laughs> since I got it. And I did an episode of my show, which will also be released on Record Store Day today, uh -huh. uh, talking with someone who loves this album and knows it inside and out. And it was so much fun. And it gave me such a great appreciation for it. Um, and I'm I'm hoping we do spend some time on it because, uh, Larry, let me thank you also for having me on this show. And I really look forward to this opportunity to discuss the true follow up album to Number One in Heaven. Mm, very good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't miss that the first time. I did, too. But it is this is this is my copy from a thousand years ago. Um, yeah, there it is. There it is. There it is. And uh I, it, it is, in my opinion, the true follow-up to Number One in Heaven. And I, I'm hoping we have a chance to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So it, it never really, did it kind of bomb when it came out? or Yeah. 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 That, that's sad because I remember buying it thinking, oh, this is, you know, it really catchy and everything. Is, oh, this is going to be a big hit, of course. <laughs> it got some rotation yeah. in some uh, clubs and some yeah. dance clubs, uh, a.k.a. discos. Um, in Germany and L.A. And I, I know there was a release in the U.K., but I'm not sure how much play it got over there. But certainly on the charts, not, not at all. And they, and they released three singles. Yeah. What are you going to do? Um, I I tell you what, hearing what you said a moment ago, though, uh, Monty, about the uh, the uh, interview uh, subject who knew everything uh, about the, this album. I, my I'm my interest is peaked because I have so many <laughs> questions about this album, mostly about the well, you know, about the provenance. The where did this part come from? Where did that come from? Who's playing on it? Who, who's engineered it and i i have yet to uh to to find a a, a source that has oh, that well, information no that's you one of the that? things that we talked about he doesn't know and that's one of the mysteries of this album mm -hmm. is that there's no credits wow it's simply produced and written and by ron mail uh, ron and russell mail and 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 that's it and yeah you know, that's one of the mysteries of it the whole thing is kind of cloaked in mystery it kind of came and went and yeah. uh, he just he I really should thank you, too, Christian, because you got me thinking about it on your show because of the connection between dancing is dangerous and is there more to life than dancing. Mm -hmm. And that Before got me thinking after. that there's more to this album than I originally thought. Mm -hmm. So kudos to you and thank you for that. That really got me thinking. And then we got started talking about the second side where you have a suite of songs that also seem to have a connection. So there, I, it's, I've come yeah. to feel there's a lot on this album. Yeah, I'm glad they're re-releasing it. It's probably yeah. so all of us loose can look into it further. Yeah. yeah. You know. What? Oh yeah. Um, I'm not being recorded. It's not. I, you you never get the sense that Ron and Russell are approaching oh. it, the Noel album as a major work. Just say hi. But you know, maybe more of like a a, a genre exercise. Um, it's definitely a more direct 
take on disco than number one in heaven without a doubt mm -hmm. kind of sounds like you know what could be the disco after party to a show where you know you're introduced <laughs> to the entire number one and in, and in, in heaven album um so it, it was it's interesting to hear ron and and russell really go all out or as close as they ever got to con to contemporary for the time disco um and i'm curious those of you who heard it uh, around the time of its release did it sound to your ears distinct and some notable way from uh, a lot of the other disco more I guess more technologically forward disco at that time. Oh yeah. I, I really liked it. It was uh, comparable to number one in heaven. Yeah. That's high, high praise indeed. High praise yeah. indeed. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean, for me, I listened to dancing is dangerous and love that. Yeah. And the rest of it, I listened to maybe once and it's like, yeah, yeah okay. And yeah, yeah. I didn't really think about it. Me yeah. Neither. Yeah. I, uh, one thing that I, I get from a lot of it thematically, and I'll say, you know, through Ron's eyes, because we you know, tend to assume that he wrote all, all the lyrics, is it, it's sort of a looking at disco and dance culture from a slight distance, looking at it kind of cockeyed. There's a lot of singing about dancing and nightlife boogieing uh you know uh, uh romantic sexual um, encounters and uh but there's always that ron spin of it not quite sneering but uh but definitely holding something at a, at a distance and examining it in a sort of like impersonal way that is a, a hallmark of uh, a lot of Ron's uh, lyrics. And that's all over this thing, in my opinion. Well, well, even the title dancing is dangerous. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, you know, go out to the disco, you might not make it back. Yeah. Kind of thing, you know, you could pull a hamstring. <laughs> yeah. You could go to heaven. You could break a butterfly collar. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting thought about, you know, the whole role of dancing and, and how they look at it. I mean, I can't, as, as listening to you, Christian, I was thinking about the song dance, God damn it. Mm -hmm. where he's mm -hmm. <laughs> want to dance want to dance but he doesn't want to dance i mean he's like he's scared to go out there and dance right. but yeah, i thought that was a brilliant you know i've always, it's always been a favorite song and uh yeah it makes you think of other places too it makes me want to think about other things too because yeah. that is a kind of a something he comes back to quite a few yeah. times yeah agree yeah all, all of these all of these sort of rituals that surround this mating dance that he comes back to very, very often. And, and dancing and the disco culture was the one that he really um, seized on for, for this album, lyrically yeah, and sonically. Yeah, but I, I think it's, it's just really telling that these are the two that they re-released and that they did not re-release uh, Terminal Jive. And I yeah. think there's something to be said about that, you know, what they think of those albums. And I know we've talked about this in various mm -hmm. fora, and I know it has its fans, but I think it's very telling that they personally believe this was the one that they wanted to get out there. What a way to legitimize and 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 raise the profile of this record that probably, you know, thousands of Sparks fans probably have never even heard of. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, if it wasn't for the fan club, I wouldn't have known about it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I ran into it. There was a store in Bo in Boston where I was at the time, Chelsea, uh, and they hope they would hold records for me. And they said, Hey, there's something new in the sparks bin. So I checked it out and there it was. And they said, Oh, it was produced by Ron and Russell. And that's how this I found it. lady in spandex. <laughs> I know. It's like, oh, look oh, like yeah. Ron and Russell. Yeah. Maybe Russell slightly. Yeah. Yeah, I was in Colorado when that came out, Denver, Colorado. But I had a friends who had Wax Tracks records, and they had all the Sparks 
mm. of singles. Every time I came in, here, here's a new Sparks 45. So I had, that's why I have all the early 45s, you know, from them, you know, and they're really cheap and the albums too. Uh, and, the, and the funny thing is when the first time I saw the store, they had that big cutout from industry, you know, the one, one where they're holding the, um, uh, uh, Bag. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. driving with my dad mm -hmm. and I'm like, stop the car. And I jumped out and I ran in. Oh my God, you have a spark sing. And ever since then, I was fan, friends with them. In, in Denver, Colorado, yeah, yeah. nobody knew who sparks were then, except right. for them. Right. But um, I mean, I don't want to belabor this, but uh, you know, to me, the fact that they're re releasing it mm -hmm. again tells you a lot about what they think. And mm -hmm. My, my feeling and the reason why is that this was the era and I say this on the show and I don't want to repeat myself, but my feeling is that this is the era where they had said sparks are done with guitars. Right. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. just two right. years later on terminal jive there, they were again. So that era didn't last very long, but they were clearly experimenting with what does disco mean to us? How do we convey our image, our vision through mm -hmm. disco? And I think what you have here on this album is just completely unfettered, with the, by by Giorgio, you know, let's see what we can do here on our own and how we can make this our own. Whereas, uh, and whereas I think with uh, Terminal Jive, they had some constraints that they were dealing with. But here, this was them. This was them still in that yeah. phase of we don't need guitars. What are we going to do? And I think that's part of the reason for me personally why it's such a great album and why it's so important and such an important and so cool that they're re-releasing it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, and to that point, it it is interesting that that they are shining shining a spotlight on the Noel album again, and uh, as opposed to say Terminal Jive, which famously was a record that uh, they played little or or none on. Um, in fact, I I'm still not a hundred percent sure if Ron actually gets to play keyboards on that record at all. Right. Um, so it it makes me that that's that's what makes me want to believe that these guys may be running at least most of the show in terms of what you hear on on the record. I don't know that that's true. I don't know about, you know, I don't you know, know if Ron or or Russell can play the bongos or the baritone sax or tenor sax or whatever kind of sax that was, but that there's some fascinating uh, uh, sonic flourishes that you do not hear on any Sparks production before or, or after. Yeah. Well, I do hope they'll tell us a little bit about who was on it when it comes out again. Me too. Yeah. Yep. All right. Let's talk a little bit about this album. So, so in 1977, they released Introducing Sparks, which was their, you know, trying to be a bit more commercial with pop rock. And I, I had a friend who absolutely hated Sparks. <laughs> and he used to tease me constantly. <laughs> but when Introducing Sparks came out, guess what? He ended up buying the album. So when this came out, as much as I loved it, I was thinking, oh, oh my God, he's going to hate this. And of course, <laughs> he, he hated it. So he's back to hating Sparks. This doesn't sound but, like Beach Boys. But, you know, before it came out, I was kind of a bit concerned because, you know, Sparks going disco, that's kind of all you would hear. But as soon as I played it, it had the Sparks personality. It had Russell's falsetto, which, you know, kind of came and went in the last few albums. And it had their personality stamped on. It. So I, right away, I loved the, and it, and it sounded so fresh and it still sounds so fresh today. Great production, of course. So I've always loved the album. Joe. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's funny because the I was getting prepared for it by the, the newsletter and I was looking it up. And, and this is what they say. It says, whereas other Sparks albums predicted innovation in degrees, number one in heaven is such a radical advancement from the past that many male devotees will be thrown for a pro proverbial loop. <laughs> so I was so I was like, okay, I'm, but I was I was all in for Sparks. But and I did when I listened to it, there's Russell's voice, 
there's a great lyrics, even the music, musicality. It wasn't a disco album to me. No. And like I said, I was in punk rock and it was like disco sucks to us, you know. So I really did not want them to have a disco album, but none of my friends would could understand that album, you know. But um, they were geniuses, you know, at, and, and each of the songs, you know, I, I loved it, of course. You know, I ran out and bought it at Wax Tracks. And, um, you know, so... And then the newsletter would just go on about, you know, the, the uh, you know, their success or whatever with that. So, you know, if you just read that, you think, oh, it's big everywhere else. Because living in Colorado, you think, well, there's probably big elsewhere, but Colorado, you know, not so much yet. Uh, but it, it wasn't as big as I thought they were. And they weren't, they weren't like superstars all over the world like I, I, they are in my mind. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just from the first time I saw Sparks to even just listen to that, you look at them and you go, something's just off with these guys. They're not normal. <laughs> so you, they're not, you know, even when they're no. trying to be normal. When I was watching him do um, Talent in His Ass and I'm watching him singing and I'm like, yeah, that's probably what Ron, Ron got my attention. Yeah. And, you know, and I love his uh, piano playing. It's a like keyboard playing and synthesizer yep. Yep. all over all the different flourishes and the melodies. They're very strong, much more than a, in regular disco songs. And, and, you know, now I'll listen to some disco songs. I, I admit yeah. it. But um, I, I really loved, liked it. Beat the Clock was my favorite. Yeah. Um, you know, like Monty, I, I was listening to Monty, that he used to think that was the start of the album. Because like, when, mm. when you have two sides, of like, yeah, yeah, makes sense. Because, you know, that started off and then it ended with number one song in heaven, which makes sense, you know. But, um, and of course, La Dolce Vita I liked because of the Fellini reference. You know, mm. and I named my fanzine after that, yep. after the song. So... That's I saw that. You posted that, that on Facebook. That, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. Okay, I'm going to ask you guys a uh, question, much like the last one I asked, the kind that's uh, going to make you feel old. So similar to Noel, when this when this album came out and you guys were already established Sparks fans, I'm guessing, uh, Larry, you too. And uh, Ch Chelsea, I'm not sure what your... Actually, uh, um, this was the first Sparks album I heard, and I heard it in 2008. Mm. Um, there was a huge article on them in Arthur Magazine um, that had, uh, it, was right, it was right before um, the 21 by 21 and the release of Exotic Creatures of the Deep. Um, and Ned Raggett had written um, capsule reviews oh, yeah. of each, each of the, um, we love Ned, um, mm -hmm. cap like little capsule reviews of each of the songs and, or each of the albums you, you, writing capsule reviews of each of the songs would be a lot. Um, but he, <laughs> he, um, he wrote and I couldn't, and uh, we were on e-music at that point and, um, and uh, they didn't have any of the, like the big three. I don't think they had half Nelson, um, but the, you know, like the earliest record you could get that was on e-music was number one in heaven. And I thought, well, um ned liked this one i'll give it a whirl and uh i listened to it for the first time um in may of 2008 um at the public gardens in boston um and uh and, and i um i associate it with um with with you near know, kind of springtime and with um the public gardens because it, like that's where i heard it for the first time and uh and it was it, it really uh it, it I don't want to say it imprinted on me because that sounds creepy, but it was definitely the album where I was like, I love these guys and I need to hear more of this. Um, so I'm kind of out of time with that, um, with, with the release of that album because I didn't hear it when it came out. And, you know, it's, it's not usually the first record you recommend to someone for getting into Sparks. So that's my capsule history with this album. Yeah, That's, that's cool. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, it's, uh, almost exactly the same but synchronous. So I, I I first heard that album in about May of two thousand eight. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I, I was late to the party as well. Yeah, um, yeah. So I wanted to ask you guys who were already uh, established Sparks fans and rock fans, and this was also nineteen seventy nine, which was the year of the the disco demolition derby and the disco yep. suck mm -hmm. started and all that sort of yep. stuff. How did you guys, I mean, there must have been like cognitive dissonance. Uh, how did, how did you guys receive it? Oh, and were, did, were you sympathetic towards 
disco slash electronic music. Well, yeah, I, I liked I liked like you know craft work. Yeah, uh, I like craft work. And I guess I like some you know the Bee Gees. No, I, I like some dance music. It was just your typical bad disco music. I was worried about Sparks <laughs> going to. And the other thing I wanted to, to mention uh, a memory is in the early '80s, I used to disc jockey, and I don't know if you remember Stars on Forty Five. The Beatles medley. It was like a 16 minute long medley. And it started with you got to beat the clock. You got to. Mm -hmm. And I was so, you know, so proud. It's like that sparks, you know. Yeah. And it was a pretty big hit, like for, for this, this jogging one. Oh, good. And, you know, they're dancing to sparks <laughs> almost. Yeah, let's see. With their crazy lyrics. I love yeah. those lyrics with that beat the clock. It's my yeah. favorite. Um, well, like I said, I was into punk rock, so there was some. I was secretly like some disco songs. Yeah. Um, I love craft work, so I, you know, so I like electronic, and I was such a big Ron and Russell fan that I just would follow them. I wow. think we trusted them too, right? Yeah, right. I, I right. did. So, right. right. So I wasn't gonna be. I wasn't like, oh my god, you know. Yeah. Uh, no, I said okay. You know, it made my mind more open. Yeah. Uh, to that. Yeah. Um, be, because right. they'd already changed their sound so many times, right? And every right. time I loved them. So, yeah, yeah they just seem like the kind of band that, um, you know, you look at the nineteen, the late nineteen seventies, and you had a lot of like um, band rock bands who decided to try to go disco. Like, there's a Kiss disco song. <laughs> yeah. um, if memory serves, there's a Grateful Dead disco song, but oh I could God. be hallucinating that. <laughs> Ah. And it was just, it was treated as like, okay, we got to get, check this off the list where I think mm -hmm. that with Sparks, um, they like, if they're going to do something, they're really going to do it and they're going to do it to the best of their abilities. And they're not, they're going to just leave it all on the, on the stage. So I think that like one of the things that may have kept them out of the, the disco backlash is the fact that, you know, like they were changing up their style, but they're also a band where, you know that if they're going to dabble in something or, you know, if they're going to going to play with a new genre, they're going to do it in a way where they, they really take the music seriously. Yeah. So I think that they also have that going for them. Yeah. There's some intelligence that's going to be in it. And also, yeah. you know, the Rolling Stones miss you in 1978. That was kind of a disco yeah. song. Yeah. And I, I like that. So great song. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's no, it's no, do you think I'm sexy? No. <laughs> <laughs> <Of course not. laughs> yeah. I mean, but, um, yeah. yeah, I wasn't, I was, you know, I was reading the uh, newsletters along with Joe and, you know, looking forward to every one of them and following all this. And after the last three or four albums, which were so, if you think about it, propaganda, indiscreet, big beat, introducing their four albums that are from totally different places. So I was like, okay, well, let's see what they want to do now. And I, I wasn't as big a fan as introducing as some, but, you know, it was like, by then I was hooked on, like you said, Chelsea, it was, it's those two guys and what they do. So I was like, let's see what they come up with next. And I, I don't like any electronic music and I still don't. Um, occasionally, you know, there's a fun disco song or something, but it's not my genre, but I heard it and I just thought, this is really great. This is really great. Ron and Russell male new sparks music. And from the first time I heard it in Boston, uh, as we, Chelsea, um, I heard beat the clock on college radio and, it's like, yeah, this is this is great stuff. And the songwriting is really solid, um, yeah. which I think is, you know, like, I mean, you know, no disrespect to do you think I'm sexy? Um, but, <laughs> you, you know, like one of the things that I have found really striking as I've worked on this, as uh, as I've worked on the covers album is that the melodies are really strong. Um, the lyrics are hilarious until they're poignant. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, that Ron just seeds these little like riffs. There's this one riff that builds from verse to verse in number one song in heaven where it just, mm -hmm. it starts out as a C note and then it's a little da da da. And then you listen, you listen to the song and that, that riff just keeps evolving. Um, so it's just, I think that the, the fact that the songwriting was really strong, I think also um, brought the, it was, it was um, like made it possible for them to, um, to release a disco album and, and yeah, you know, like they understood the assignment, I guess, as mm -hmm. the kids say. So yeah, and also having a real drummer helped mm -hmm. big mm -hmm. time too. Yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, well, that, that's, that's a big that difference. Was, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I, I, I just want to interject this quickly. That is one difference that you do pick up on immediately when you start listening to number one in heaven versus the no Noel album is as much as I like the Noel album, it does not have that full bodied varied drumming that you get with the Keith Forsey stuff on number one. Uh, fully agree. Yeah. Fully agree. Yeah. The drumming is so good and it's, it, it's, it's so complex. It's so complex that it's just, it's mind blowing to know that there was a guy who did that. I know, not a machine, right? It's like, oh, it's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, totally. And just, you know, if you listen to Academy Award performance, those fills are just, oh, oh, yeah. dun, dun, dun. it's just beautiful. It's beautifully done. And apparently Keith Forsey what, didn't, had, wasn't really hearing the songs. He would just hear little bits of mm -hmm. it. Really? Georgia would say, okay, play this, which to me is, I don't know. There's so many myths with Sparks, who knows? But mm -hmm. That's what they've always said, and that's but, what he but, said in an interview. And but Academy Award performance, it's almost like a hard rock disco song. It's, it it's is. pretty heavy. It comes yeah. right out of the gate. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's like, I even thought that great rock of her song, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what Russell, with those notes, hitting, yeah. hitting, hitting those high notes, you yeah. know, like nobody else. Mm -hmm. The first what? time he sings, you got to beat the clock, yeah. it's just magic. I know. Oh, yeah. One of the things that I found really striking about Academy Award performance is that um, it almost like I I can see where you would say it sounds like a hard rock disco song. But when I play it, it sounds like something that you would hear in an MGM musical in the 50s um, because it's just it's hmm. so really melodic. And there's that like percolating da 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 riff and it just it sounds like something where you know i don't know if it's the the fact that the the lyrics are about performance or what Probably. but i just um when i listen to it i just have this mental image of like busby berkeley and you know like rows and rows of of uh chorus girls like arranged in in mm -hmm. different geometric um so it's just it is it's interesting that we all have a different take on what genre this is. Where yeah, you know, like we're agreeing that it's disco, but then it's like it's disco, but it's all but there are also all of these other influences in it as well. Yeah, and I think the most probably the most underrated song. I think it like for me, it's really grown in stature over the years. It's my other voice. It is gorgeous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It really is. That's the one I would skip over if I was, you know, because I like yeah. all the fasting. But now I've yeah. been listening to the hell, whole album now again, right? Yeah. I, I played it a lot. Yeah. Uh, and I'm loving every song, like, for the first time again. And I was really listening to that one. I went, that's great. It's gonna kind of creepy, yeah. some yeah. of the words. It, you know, that has, like, the least words, because you're looking at the, the lyric sheet. Whoa. You know. I have a story about one of the times I, I heard my other voice um in oct in no sorry august of 2009 um i was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder um and this is something that i'm very open about that eh, i've got it um and uh i had this um it, i i had this uh therapist and i went in and she said so after talking to you and after reviewing your medical records i think that this is you know this is your diagnosis and i said okay um, because I didn't really know, you know, it's one of those, like, yeah, I, I sort of figured that something like that was going on. And, um, you know, I, I got up and I walked, you know, after the appointment was over, I walked out of the doctor's office and um, I'd started walking home and I put my iPod on shuffle. And the first song that came up was My Other Voice. And I always liked My Other Voice fine, but there was this point, you know, like when I was listening to it, where it just, it sounded like, if you gave my anxiety attack a, a like a, a a song in a musical, Thanks. this is the song it would have. Um, the uh, you know, like you're you're so so independent, but that's going to change real soon. With my other voice, I will destroy this room. Right. Um, won't be deaf to me. So it was just it was this hilarious moment of of like, oh, the, you know, like they get it, they get me, and uh, and and I know that that's not what the song is about. I can think of like three or four things that it, it's probably about, but just in that moment, it was uh, about you know, like it, it it 
it let me laugh at something that was very serious and I'm very thankful for that. That's a great story. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And you um, know, I, always I, like I think everybody story. has anxiety. I, I get anxiety. Like it's normal, you know. <laughs> I have it. I have yeah. it too, yeah. to a point. Yeah. But mine would probably go to Academy Award performance. My inter my well, internal but, my internal clock is fast. You know, yeah. I realize that I like really fast stuff. Yeah. So well, I will say after Chelsea's description, I will never hear uh Academy Award performance the same. Way I, I know. I love I love the fact that the real you said, 50 years I can you said, still, but, be, still hear these songs in a way I never did before. I know. I can hear sing. the melody when this do, 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 and I do, do, yeah. people dancing. Yeah, now I'm gonna see the dancing girls and 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 then just <laughs> the song, the number one song in heaven. What a masterpiece. Like the first half is you know really gorgeous or whatever mm -hmm. but that second half with the bubbling synthesizers and everything it's just it's just sound even today it sounds just so fresh and amazing yeah and you miss a lot from just the single version yeah because you don't get that that two-part yeah i wish like they would perform the whole day in thing a life live. almost yeah i've always wished they performed the whole thing live too yeah. um but it's they do it at the end as part of the big you know rock yeah. finale out. And everybody yeah, by then know. is jumping out of their seat. So, yeah. you know, but it's yeah. held up after all this time. That's like the big one, right? Yeah. I have yeah. one question about that song. Who writes songs like that? I mean, who? I mean, you there's got, this guy named Ron. Yeah. <laughs> Gen what kind of genius sees like, a song like that? Like, why are you hearing all... it now? You say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's an astounding song. It, it's so beautiful at the beginning. And, I going back to the earlier discussion, I don't see it as a disco album per se. I think that Tryouts for the Human Race, the second half of this song, and Beat the Clock are, are disco. And but overall, I see this as Sparks putting on their vision on electronic music mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and exactly. exploring that, which no one else has done like this before. They didn't they didn't say, you know, I think they were you kind of put into the box on the on terminal jive you know and we're going to make these disco sounding songs and we need you to perform and do this and that whereas here they were given free reign and my god what a collaboration with giorgio yeah he really understood them and and how great that it was somebody like sparks who are naturally inclined to try out all these different genres um so that they could do things with uh they could do stuff with with electronic music that hadn't been done before like most producers were sticking with a handful of forms with the gear and a lot of it was just kind of four on the floor disco you know that you would you know dance to so not not a lot of variation what i i love talking with uh with electronic music fans who are fans of this album because they will go into great detail about how uh, um, uh, my, my other voice uh, planted the seed for uh, trance music and you know you've got uh, house music on number one in heaven the final song and all these sub genres that you can point to this being the source th this particular album you hear a lot of that with uh, people steeped in the history of electronic music who cite this album. So much of it has their starting points in, in this album. And I, it's, and it's mind blowing. And that's what to me is besides the fact that it was just, that was Ron and Russell and they have their high, um, you know, level of quality control. It was, just also that they they just messed around with the form in such adventurous ways and it spawned all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. I love that. And, and that's why when Terminal Jive came out, it was such a, it was the very first time, it was such a huge disappointment. It was like... I, I like it a lot now, but I mean, back, you know, when it came out, it was like, oh, uh, this is like, yeah, 
it's not them. It's not, it didn't have enough of their personality. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We all, I, I can't speak. I agree. I yeah. agree. Yeah. It didn't have enough of their personality. Um, they were put into a box, you know, they, they were told, we want you to make this kind of music. Whereas I think Giorgio's great contribution and vision is that he said, we're going to take what you do and we are going to let you run with it. And I'm going to help you with this. But he wasn't interested in that anymore. Yeah. I think it was too far a few my my personal theory after thinking about this a lot, Christian, is that he just said, This is just too far afield from what I do. I need to go back and produce Donna Summer type stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, this was fun, but I can't do this for four albums. Even you guys are too weird. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was a good that was an experiment on his part. Like, so let's yeah. see where this goes. Okay, now now that I've did that, I'm going back. Yeah. And it just because you wouldn't think he would do that because it was such a hit. Yeah, yeah. But clearly, he was like, I can do hits by creating. Oh, yeah. He, he, he wasn't thirsting for hits. Yeah, at, that, at that well, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah, in fact, he, he won a uh, an Academy Award right. uh, not too long after that album and song um, was released. He won an Academy Award for a soundtrack to, oh, sure. the one about the Turkish prison, Midnight. Oh, Midnight. Oh, yeah. Midnight, Midnight Express. Express. Excellent movie. Yeah, Midnight. Yeah. yeah, it was a great movie. Yeah, I like that. Uh, Neat. Chelsea, you you were gonna say something there? Yeah, I was gonna say that listening to Terminal Jive is like looking at someone who's wearing a suit that's like two sizes too small, um, <laughs> and it's just it's you know that you understand the aesthetic, but it just you just feel discomfort looking at them because you can imagine how like tight that must feel. Um, mm. I think I've really only listened to it twice, and uh, and it just it doesn't they don't sound like themselves. It sounds like you know. It, it sounds like someone's idea of sparks yeah. rather than yeah. what yeah. they like. Although stereo is great. It's my favorite song on stereo is good. We all probably yeah. can name one or two others that we like. Let's not talk about young girls. I have <laughs> a feeling you're going to go there. Yeah. yeah. Not, no, actually not me. That, <laughs> that divides the room No. <laughs> with most people on, you know, one side. Really stereo greatest show on earth. That's about yeah. it for me. Yeah. When I'm with you, of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's not yeah. when I played it at any, you know. And the rest is all okay. Ages. It's all yeah. okay and listenable now and then. But I, I love the word that you use, Chelsea, imprinted on you. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, this album is just imprinted on me. Terminal Jive, I don't even think it was released in, it certainly wasn't released in North America. No, it, it was wasn't. Released it anywhere. was not. So at least here in Canada. Oh, well, it was released in Canada. Yeah. But not in the U.S., I remember. No. Right. Yeah, so that kind of I'm the one that bought a copy of it. I knew it. <laughs> I got, got the lone North American copy. Yeah, I think I ended up waiting a long time after just to get it for the collection, but I didn't buy it at the time either because it was, you know, not released here. I mean, I'm sure I could have gotten it on import. I hunted it down. I got it at the Tower Records in Georgetown. Oh. And, uh, you know, just 1980, didn't have a lot of money, but it was, this is got to get it. And I was like, hmm, I don't know what to make of this one. Whereas number one, heaven right away is like, oh, this has so many layers. There's so much going on here. And that's what a Sparks album should do. Yeah. It should, you know, appeal to you at one level and then you hear it more and more and you hear all these other ways of hearing it. That to me, that's what Sparks do. And this album has never reached that for me. And and no. thankfully they made Want That Sucker next. <laughs> we could be here all day. Yeah, <laughs> all weekend. Let's let's talk about each album. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did. I mean, one album um, would take four hours. Out of curiosity, what do, what do you guys who have heard it uh, make of the um, the the newer versions on? Um, oh gosh, how did I forget now? The self covers of plagiarism because they they covered. I know they did number one in heaven mm -hmm. twice. And I think yeah. they did beat the clock. Yeah, yeah. they did. Yep. Curious what they because you know because the source material was famously electronic. Yeah. And then it wasn't as they, good. It, it wasn't. Yeah. No. Yeah. I. I didn't to, think so. to me, plagiarism is a fun album to listen yeah. to now and then. It's different. It's kind. Of, I. It's kind of cool, and that's it. I will say, yeah. like there, there were some imp like songs I actually like better on plagiarism. 
or plagiarism uh, or as much like angst in my pants. I really yeah, like yeah. that yeah. version. Yeah, that was that. good. Yeah, I feel the same way. There's yeah. a few songs I liked. Maybe the and Faith then with no Faith No More, yeah, I, Faith liked, no more. I liked something for the girl with everything, but mm -hmm. I did not yeah. like this town ain't big enough for both of us. I think the singer for Faith No More just kind of ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, to me, it was fun. Yeah. I liked the Faith No More covers a lot. Yeah. But that was it. Then I moved on. You know, I, yeah. I could still listen to it. Sure. But why? Yeah. I like the Jimmy Somerville vocals on uh, Number One in Heaven. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that he's one of the very few people who, you know, you could just not to not to like belabor a point, but you could describe his falsetto as heavenly. And yeah. um, and it just it's it, and, you know, um, I thought he worked really well. I thought that um, his voice worked really well with Brussels. Um, I really I, I liked that version a lot, but it's not something that I go back and listen to. Um, I think I had listened to it. Uh, I had listened to that version of number one song um number one just to get some of the um like the harmonies to see if it was something that i could apply to my cover hmm. and number two because i'd seen the love lies bleeding trailer and uh which uses small town boy and i'm like oh that's a good song i should go back and listen hmm. to bronski beat Bronsky. and then that came up and you know like recommended if you like and i thought okay jimmy somerville with sparks don't mind if i do and i listened to it and i liked it but yeah. um you know and i and i i I really enjoy everyone involved, but it's not something, you know, like if I'm going to listen to that album, I'm going to listen to, um, I'm, you know, if I'm going to listen to number one in so a song in heaven, I'm going to listen to the original version. Yeah. Um, so it's nice to have. Yeah. I have three signed copies of that, of that play of plagiarism. Cause I must've kept seeing them play and that's what they were signing. So I, so I, that for that reason. And, um, in LA, you know, the one, we, the show we went to Monty, you know, yeah. we were all talking at the table and I was talking to Ron about that. He was pointing at, he, they want, he goes, I wanted Morrissey on this album, you know, to do something, go, what song he goes, anything, you know, why don't you talk to him? And I thought, I don't know Morrissey. I guess he's got it. And, and then Russell was teasing him saying, oh yeah, that's her other guy. And I, and, and I was so embarrassed. I was turning red. And I'm, cause I'm thinking, I'm thinking all those letters I wrote to Ron over the years, you know, and I'm like, oh, they know more about me than I thought. You know? That's scary. Yeah. But, but, you know, I always think of that, you know, and it, cause there was a picture where, you know, we're pointing at the CD and I thought, is he touching my hand maybe? Oh, uh, whoo. <laughs> but um, but yes, but he said, yeah, we wanted Morrissey on this to do something. Honestly, yeah, I, got, I got an autographed copy of it too. I must have gotten it the same night you did. Yeah, right yeah, because they were they were only signing two things, and I said, okay, I only have two things. I think balls and um, that. But I have two other copies that were. Because I said, why do I have so many different copies, and they're all signed? So oh, I gotta keep them. Uh, I think in London, I might have got one, or and then maybe in New York. Honestly, though, based on what Morrissey has become, I almost yeah. think they, they dodged. Mm, they they oh, wouldn't they want did. him to sing on an album now. No, they <laughs> wouldn't. And I kind of moved on from him, too. But at the time, they really liked him, and I liked him. And they obviously knew that, too. And I said, how do they know that? I mean, I'm kind of, it was kind of like taken aback, like, oh. Uh, but Morrissey was at that show, though. Uh, and I, and yeah. I talked to him in the downstairs and i talked to him about sparks i didn't talk to him about morrissey i said about the new york dolls and sparks and it, we were talking about sparks and I said, well i have to go now and i shook his hand nice meeting you like i had like sorry i'm busy you know let me <laughs> shake your hand i gotta go up and i ran up and i was right in the front row right when sparks came on so yeah that was awesome. that was actually a special night that's really cool in many ways right monty oh yeah 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 hey hey larry um can I ask a question? Because I'm no, really interested no. in what. Okay. <laughs> do it anyway. All right, I'll do it anyway. Um, I'm going to ask a question because I'm really interested in what people think about this. The what I really want to hear about is thoughts that you might have about how this album, really th this whole period, and you can define the period however you want, impacted their overall career, and what it meant for them in terms of the overall career arc that they had. And I definitely have some thoughts, but I really would like to hear from others. I think th this is comparable to Kimono My House for the, yeah. because this album, as we all know, influenced quite a few bands like New Order and mm -hmm. other ones. So I think this is one of the highlights of their whole career. Absolutely. 
Yeah. And I think that got them thinking, you know what, we're going to do what we want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and, you know, that started that, you know, you know, they went through uh, several different, um, different genres after that. Right. But they always, then they would switch on you, pull the rug out from under you when, yeah. if you like them to romp that sucker or whatever. But to me, that was their, them saying, you know, we can step out of our comfort zone. We could do something different. The fans that will want to come with us will. We'll get new fans. We'll lose fans. We don't care. You know, yeah. and that's how, and that's kind of how they've gotten today. Today, we think of little, little Beethoven. Yeah. How yeah. that was different, you know. For me, what makes this album such a quintessential Sparks album is it was the, the first time when the two guys realized that they could just be the band. I mean, obviously you've got Giorgio and his gear and producing and showing the ropes. And, and then you've got uh, Keith Forsey on drums, but they could see what shape it would take. They, they, could, they could see that it was viable to be uh, an act with just two guys. And, you know, later on they would realize that more fully. Mm -hmm. they wouldn't have to hire and fire bands all, you know, all right. the time. They didn't want to. I think that um, they've always been very experimental in the studio, but one of the things that, that I found really striking about this is that they didn't do that many, you know, they did some TV um, appearances, but they didn't tour behind this album. And I'm wondering if this album was like the beginning of their say, they're like really treating this as, well, this could just be a studio act. Um, and I, I, like, I think that obviously at, like, we've seen them recreate the songs live or we've seen them do new versions of the songs, but in order to tour with that, like there's that quote from Ron where he was like, well, we would need to have a computer that was three stories yeah. high. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. so I think it, that was there, that was, you know, just to build a little bit on what Christian said, I think that it was not only, um, you know, the band could be uh, these two guys, but it was also the band could be these two guys and it, you know, it could just be a studio thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Turns out they love touring though. Who go go figure. They love yep. touring. They love touring. Um so, so this I guess I don't know. Are are they recording a new album or is this something to do with the movie that's coming out? Oh, that's a whole big question, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I don't have any new information about the movie. I don't even remember the title, which I First read several months ago, so I, I don't know about a something like a studio album other than that. It's excruciator. Excruciator. Yeah, that's right. Some okay. weird name. Yeah. Yeah, and they just released uh, a song that was on a movie soundtrack. Um, that was Space a, Man. Yeah, that's the movie. Yes. Yeah. And it was. Uh, oh, I forget the name of the track, but uh, it's. Uh, they're working okay. with. Um, someone else whose name i can't remember somebody remember from the going. classical realm which tells me that's right that might be a place that they're Good. going i i my feeling about that song is it it's a bit on the lengthy side mm -hmm. mm. you know after about three minutes i'm kind of okay got it but yeah it's not a tight pop song structure no but if i can just weigh in on that question i really loved hearing what everybody said and basically i agreed with with everybody. Um, and the, the, what I would add to it is that I think building on what Joe and, and Christian said specifically, um, you know, I think if you look at what happened later, they were really moving, you know, they moved back to being a duo and they went, they, they went in the eighties, there were really only two albums that were all out rock albums where they really just let it go with the band. And by the time they got to Sparks in Outer Space, it was basically an electronic album with some guitars. And it was kind of like, maybe this is where they would have gone. And it seems like they really, to, I guess what I'm saying is I think that this ignited a real big interest in them in how they can use electronics to advance their own vision. And I think they came back to that periodically. And then by the time you got to Little Beethoven, that was it. That was it. We were now Sparks. We've learned from all these years. And we're going to take this in the direction that we want to. And I think the origins of that go all the way back to this album. Yep. So I think it's been pretty damn impactful on their career. And 
should yep. be cr cr rightfully so, as Larry said, rightfully so. It's it's one of the best albums they've ever done. Here, so, here. It, it is. It holds up really well. I'm not, I really enjoyed re-listening to it, and I liked it even more. I guess with having all these other albums in between now, you know, I mean, we're lucky to mostly keep up with each release. I, you know, I can't imagine. I, I'm fascinated when people find Sparks like in 2008 and they have all this back catalog yeah. and whatever one you first listened to. Yeah. It's like, wow, you know. Well, there, there's this new newer band called King Gizzard and the L Lizard Wizard or something like that. <laughs> They're really good, right? And but they they release about two or three albums a year. They got like twenty or thirty albums. It's like I don't want to be a fan of them, like <laughs> you know, because they'd want to buy every every one of their albums. And I don't have the time or the money. <laughs> I know, not anymore. Yeah. 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 Well, so how, how do we wrap this up, Monty? I just think uh, I think it's been a great discussion, and I think. Yeah. I, I love thinking of these two albums together yeah. and kind of, to me, they're the set, you know? So yeah. that's why I'm so excited about the record store day release and why I think it's so poignant. They're the set and terminal jive is the outlier. And uh, the more I listen to the Noel album, the more I'm convinced of that. And, you know, so I think it's really, all I'll say to wrap it up is just, this has been really fun. Yeah. And, and Chelsea, I'm curious, what do you think of the, the recent sparks albums? Um, I like them. I think that like, so if we're just going from 2000, I really like little Beethoven. Um, I wasn't as, as much in love with, um, with, uh, hello, young lovers and exotic creatures. Um, oh. but, uh, I, I mean, um, yeah, they're, they're not my favorites, but they're somebody's favorites. Um, and then I really loved FFS. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, I've been on board with, um, you know, with hippopotamus and steady drip, drip, drip. And, uh, the girl is crying and her latte came out, um, a couple days before my birthday. And, uh, it was really lovely to get a birthday gift and I, I adore. So, um, that one also has a very special place in my heart. Cool. Yeah. And Christian, <clears throat> moi, can That's you repeat the question? <laughs> I know, I forgot. <laughs> what are what are some final thoughts on everything here that we've been talking? Oh, about? oh, you're giving me the. the I want to end final, this in the next couple final of hours. Thoughts, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Go listen to it. It's yeah. genre defining. It, it rocks. It pops. It swings. It bops. Number one heaven and its companion sister album, Noel. Don't sleep on it. Yep. It'll make a great after party. <laughs> and Joe? Aperitif. Yes, this was a lot of fun for me to go back. I think my brain doesn't focus. It's all over. So I need an assignment, like number mm -hmm. one. Okay. So then I was focusing <laughs> focus, on that. Focus, focus. Yep. I know because there's just so much catalog of Sparks music yeah. and other stuff in my brain. Um, but I really enjoy it. I mean, just listening to the songs again, I, re I remember all the fun lyrics, you know, like, um, got, uh, what, what was that one from, uh, beat the clock. I mean, beat the clock. All the lyrics are great. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's like, there's no time for a rela relationship. Skip the floor, right? Foreplay, let her rip. That always <laughs> cracks me up thinking Ron writing stuff. When he writes lines let like that, they, oh, with, let her rip, you know, <laughs> so, you know, that, I just love that. I actually had to record the vocals for Beat the Clock uh, today, and I recorded uh -huh. them um, at my friend Joel's studio. And uh, my friend, you know, I've known Joel for uh, about a decade now, and I had to perform that in his studio upstairs from his uh, his wife, who is about to have her second baby, <laughs> and their four year old son. And I, you know, I'm like, you're blushing as I'm singing that. And I, I just kept saying to Joel, I'm so sorry to, to be singing this. And he's like, I don't, I don't care. I'm not paying attention to the lyrics. And I'm like, just don't look at me while I'm singing this. And, and you're like, it's fine. Right. I just don't. Yeah, pretty much. Got divorced when I was four, you know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I've been playing yeah. this this album in my car and then at home. So when I was playing it with Rob in the car, and I was singing all the lyrics of this song, and he's cracking up too. So yeah, you know, yeah. that's we love that song. Yeah. So I'll have a link for everybody's, except for Joe, because she's 
she I, doesn't have it. She's got nothing. I got I crash everybody's podcast. Yeah. And, but but so. if everybody can send me links, I'll have it below this video, and you can uh, check out everything that they do. So uh, yeah, this was fun. We'll have to do what. What are we going to talk about next for an, another Sparks discussion? Oh, let's find something really obscure. The yeah. impact of interior design on their career. <laughs> on absolutely nobody. <laughs> I, have, I have so many you know, versions of that album, I can't even believe it. I must have just kept buying them when I saw no, them. I, I would actually like to do a whole episode. It's a, well, we, we will for my podcast at, uh, at some point on uh, uh, pulling rabbits out of a hat. Yeah. And uh, in particular, the fact that it's most of it is done on one instrument and it's the Fairlight CMI. The first time you had a computer terminal that was also a synthesizer and they made extensive use of that. Uh, and it's just a cool thing to it's a cool thing to examine. I'm I, I'm just a fan of that piece yeah. of gear and what yeah. these guys did with it was great, even though it's not popularly known as one of their best efforts but yeah, it's really I, interesting to but me. like some of their albums like like that one uh even interior design i, I like them more now than i you know yeah. than in the past they kind of you yeah. respect them more as the years go by definitely and, and we know one or two people who would say there's quite a bit in interior design and would share their yeah. thoughts line by line yeah yeah um, <laughs> but christian i'm sorry larry but christian you raised such a good point that they did it all on something that was basically on a computer sized uh, piece of equipment. Maybe that's, that's worth really thinking about in terms of what I was saying before that number one, heaven really told them, Hey, this is a way we can do what we want to do and carry through our vision on our own. But the technology wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And now by this time, the technology was catching up with them. Yeah. And they didn't need a producer and they didn't even need Keith Forsey. No. no, although <laughs> I'm sure it would have added something. No, they said after Mac, after after uh, not Mac, after the one on pulling rabbits, that they decided they were never going to have an outside producer again. Mm, I forgot they did have an outside producer for that yeah, one. Yeah, Ian Little was the producer. Oh, Ian Little. Wow. Ian Little. Oh, Miller. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry for hijacking yeah. your show there, Larry. That's okay. No, this was great fun. So. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. And uh, thank you, Larry. Make sure you yeah. check out the links below, and we'll be back at some point to talk about more sparks. Yeah, you got it. It's endless. Unless we've covered everything. <laughs> yeah. Not <laughs> never.